The title of today's message is Nunya. Nunya. So does everybody know what Nunya means? Nunya business. One definition says, not your place to be concerned or involved with something, whatever it is. Nunya. Let me read you a few quotes and we'll get into this. Uh, this is Zig Ziglar, actually knew Zig and his wife, great man. He said, I believe that being successful means having a balance of success stories across the many areas of your life. You can't truly be considered successful in your business life if your home life is in shambles. Another quote, don't know who this is, just it's a quote, no one knows who said this, but gentlemen, I have lived a long time and am convinced that God governs in the affairs of men. If a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, it is probable that an empire cannot rise without his aid. I move that prayer imploring the assistance of heaven be held every morning before you proceed to business. Clovis Chappelle, <clears throat> not related, um, a religion that does not permeate and purify and uplift and sanctify business and business relations is not the religion of Jesus Christ. A.W. Tozer, God is looking for those with whom he can do the impossible. What a pity that we plan only the things that we can do by ourselves. And then another, un, not attribute to anybody, faith. It does not make things easy, it makes them possible. So, most people don't spend their, their lives in the ministry, although we'll get to that, that maybe that's what should be going on in one category at least. Most people are in business. I spent 10 years in the business world, was even before that, uh, worked my way through college, a couple of jobs, and uh, so, uh, you know, paved highways. If you want to shovel some asphalt, as long as we got good boots, I'll go with you for a while. Um... But work. Uh, if you go back to Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, then the Lord took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. There was a purpose for, for uh, Adam. And even before the fall, there was a purpose. After the fall, you read a few chapters later, um, there's going to be toil, sweat of your brow, tilling the earth. You know, it's, work is hard. I've, I've uh, developed a new appreciation for the trades. Uh, my wife and I ended up buying a house. We did not know we were taking it to the studs. <sighs> yeah, so I'm in a recovery group. If you need one, you can, you can come to ours. But Lord willing, I'm never doing that again. Uh, from the guys that did the foundation to the sheet rockers to the the tape in bed to the painters, everybody. What struck me is these guys would come in and it was every day, every day, every day. They would work hard all day long. Uh, in my case, mostly uh, because my friends that helped me with this were Hispanic. I had mostly Hispanic contractors. So it was pretty quiet on the job site at first. Everything's quiet and then it's time to go to work and they all got sound systems. They all got sound systems. <laughs> and when it was time to go to work, it was <laughs> like they'd go for like <laughs> Tejano music for like five hours straight. And then boom, somebody would kill it. About an hour and a half, they'd sit and eat lunch. Time to go back to work. <laughs> Just, you know, till quitting time. But what struck me about all that was there was, there was no escape for these guys, right? They got up every day early, and I got in there with them and, you know, would try to help and stay ahead of them in some ways. Um, you know, th there's just no way around work being work, right? But you can get consumed with your work, especially as a man. I'm not saying this isn't a woman thing, but as a man, it can be very dangerous because you can, you can kind of start mixing 
what you do with like who you are. Right? So when, when men meet men, we don't usually say, oh, hello, who are you? You know, let's talk about your feelings. One of the first things we ask is, hey, what do you do? And then he better have a good answer or he's nobody. Uh, oh, I'm a sheet rocker. Oh, so nice to meet you. And, you know, we walk off. No, you're a sheet rocker. I want to talk to you because I got respect for that. You are not what you do. Right? You are who you are. And if you don't figure out who you are, then you're going to be just barreling through life trying to prove things to people that don't even care. Um, it can just be catastrophic. So let's talk through this through the scriptures. Leviticus number, uh, 19, verse 13. Leviticus 19, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Or if you're Greek, it would be Levi Tychus. That's not true. Don't believe any of that. They'll edit it out. Um, Leviticus 19, 13. You shall not cheat your neighbor nor rob him. The wages of him who is hired shall not remain with you all night until morning. What does that mean? If someone does work for you, pay them. Now, why is this stuff in the Bible? Because we, we can be terrible people. If you have it in your hand, pay someone, right? Now, this is really practical stuff. You say, well, wait, I don't care about this. I want, I want to learn something spiritual. This is spiritual. Because what happens to business men and women is that you come in here, you turn on a sermon, you read your Bible, and then you shut that thing up and go out in the business world, and the Holy Spirit says, hey, what are we doing here? And we say what? Nunya. This is my life. We went to church. I read, I read your verses. This is none of your business, God. This is not your business. This is my business. I'm not asking you how you want to run my business. Because it's not your business. It's my business. You say, well, who's doing that? I don't know. Look around. Ask people. I've got a friend, his dad and his partner in business, and the way he tells the story, appliance business, every morning, one of them would read the scripture, the next morning, another one would read the scripture. They would pray, and they ran their business as though God ran their business. Now, you, why wouldn't someone want to do that? Why wouldn't you want to have a conversation with God and say, okay, Lord, this is your business. I belong to you. Everything that I have belongs to you. So what do you want us to do today? The reason you can't pray that is you don't trust him because if you do it his way, you can't do it your way. And if you're cutting corners, not paying your taxes, not paying people, making a mockery of his name and his reputation, I'm telling you, this is why so many business people can't share their faith in the business world. Because people look at him and go, what? You're a crook. I was in the real estate business years ago. And, and the worst of the worst were guys who were just taking people to the cleaners, but you'd go in their office. They had a big old, big old fat Bible sitting on their desk. You ran from those people. Do, there was something about it, kind of a reputation. Man, they got a big old Bible on their desk. You better run for your life. I'm not interested in the size of the Bible on your desk. I want to know the size of the scriptures in your heart. Because if you know him and you're processing that and that's in your heart and your life, that's going to come out in how you do business. And then your life is not a contradiction to what you say. Right? You're, you're not trying to cut corners. We had someone in the church the other day share that their, their company was asking them to do something unethical, whatever it was, and they quit. You got to know where the lines are. The only way you know where the lines are, you say, well, it's not necessarily un illegal. What if it's unethical? What if the Holy Spirit's already told you, get out of there or don't do this? And you say, well, I just don't have the courage. That's why you got to walk and talk with God about everything. So that when you get in these situations, you go, well, I, I, you know, I'm not doing this. So, Lord, you're going to have to take care of me. I trust you. And what does he do? He takes care of you. Deuteronomy 8, verse 18. 
and you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers, as it is this day. So it, it's in, if God wants you to be wealthy, let, let's say you work hard and you make, you make money. I want to talk to your wife and children, your husband and children. What do you mean? Because if it's really God that has blessed you, then he's going to bless you to give you a brain to be a father, a mother, everything you're supposed to be, and your house is not going to be a disaster because there will have been balance. Well, I can work a little longer, a little harder. I can make a little bit more. Kids don't care about that. You bring them a fancy gift and they play with the box. Some people are not rich because they can't handle rich, right? Uh, and all of this stuff is so bizarre. If, if you meet, it, it is almost impossible, and please just hear me out on this. When someone runs their business, ter if they are a terrible business person, illegal stuff, unethical stuff, they're the last people that are usually going to be giving to anything unless they're liquored up at an auction, And just want to showing off, wanting to, oh, I can pay for that. People who run a, a Christian person who runs their business by Christian principles understands this is not my business. This is his business. So you can't say to God, it's none your business. Because that's all it is. It is all your business. I am just the steward of what is yours. Now, if you run your business that way, and, and people say, yeah, I'm, I'm partners with Jesus. He's not your partner. He's your owner. If he's your partner, you have discussions about what you want to do, what he wants to do. That's not how it works. He's the owner, so you go to the owner and say, hey, it's your business. What do you want to do here? Then you do that. You say, but what if he asks me to do something I'm, I'm, not, I'm not comfortable doing or I'm not say I just don't have enough faith for that. Then tell him that. Say, Lord, you, you know, I know it's what you want to do with your business, but this is scary. I know the future. Trust me. You've heard me say this before. I think it should be illegal. You should have to sign some type of disclaimer if you're a Christian in business. Uh, telling people that it's not equal, it's not level ground. It's insider trading. You go to make a business decision, you go to buy stock, you go to, to do something that involves the future or the present, and you say, okay, Lord, what do you want to do? And everybody tells you, buy this stock now, it's going to go to whatever, jump in now. And the Holy Spirit says, do not spend my money on that stock. And you're like, what are you, crazy, God? This is my money. Oh, really? Now it's your money. I thought this was my money. Well, we're going to have to rethink this because you're, you're, a, you're a nutcase. I could get rich off of this. You have to learn to walk and talk with Jesus or you're going to jack your whole life up, the only life you have. And how many hours do I spend with 60, 70, 80, 90-year-old men and women, mostly men though, who are complete idiots and gave their whole lives to chasing something and then they have it at the end and go, what have I done? This is nothing. It just dissolves in their hands and they want their life back. They want their wife back. They want their kids back. They want to, they want to go back to things that matter. Deuteronomy um, 25, 13. I'm just going to read you through a bunch of these. You shall not have in your bag differing weights, a heavy and a light. What does that mean? Let's say you buy and sell stuff by the pound. You say, well, nobody does that. Go to a feedlot. Go to anywhere where it's by the pound, by the ton. And you put something on the scale. Now you say, well, that's electronic scales. You put something on there and, and offset it. Or you rig your electronic scales. You're stealing. And so people thought they bought a ton, but they bought less than a ton. And so you made a little bit more margin. And so you're getting rich off of stealing from people. Quit it. Quit it. You're a thief. Shame. 
shaving here, shaving there. God doesn't shave. You buy something, that's what you get. You should have a reputation. Man, whatever, whatever that guy says he's going to do, he's going to do it. He's faithful. He'll follow through. He'll finish the job. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. A bunch of people know this by heart. A bunch of people never heard it in their lives. But listen to this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. So you say, well, God, I have some understanding of what this stock, whatever the thing is, this business, every, it's, this, is gonna, we're gonna, this is gonna be great. But if you're not walking with him and listening to him, you start, instead of trusting him, you start leaning on your understanding of the situation, and that's when you get in trouble. You say, yeah, but I leaned on my understanding, and I got rich, and God was wrong. And you disobeyed. You say, but what about the money? It looks like I succeeded. If you disobey, you never succeed. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. So I haven't shared maybe this in a while. Rebecca, my wife and I used to be in the dress business. Uh, I ran that. I don't, you know... Um, I like doing this more. I think that was the right way to say that. Um, but here's how it can work. Uh, every day of my life for those years, the first thing I did was call the bank and see what the balance was in the account, what had cleared the, the account that night. The second thing was to check the mail and see if anybody had paid for what they bought. And people say, oh, you don't understand the stresses of business. We sold our car one day to meet payroll. You selling your car to meet payroll? Maybe you are. That's stressful. You say, well, how do you, how do you live that way? You either trust him or you don't. But it can be stressful sometimes even when you trust him. Right? But we'd have, we, we made women's apparel, we'd have buttons people come, sell us buttons, zippers, fabric, whatever it was. So in those conversations, you'd say, well, but you're a preacher. Not to them I wasn't, I was running a dress business. And we'd end up holding hands and praying and people get saved around the conference table buying buttons. You're like, well, what in the world is that? You can't mix business and religion. I didn't. I mix business and Jesus. Nobody's interested in your religion. If you don't have a relationship, you don't have a relationship to share. If you have a relationship, I mean, how many times have I looked at somebody and said, look, I'm just not doing this. I'm not buying your buttons, your zippers, whatever it is, and not tell you about Jesus. I mean, you may not want to hear about it, but we're not doing this. Because how can I say I care about you and not say what really could save your life? And you say, well, what if they get upset? I don't, you know, I'm not trying to upset anybody. I care. So what if somebody looks at you, you bring up Jesus, they go, hey, dude, none ya. I go, okay, I get it. But don't be saying on the judgment day, nobody tried. I'm somebody that loves you, cares about you, and in the course of business, I'm trying to help you. Well, it's none of your, it's none of your blankety blank business. Okay, okay. Proverbs 3, verse 9. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase, so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. And there's nothing in the New Testament about first fruits and all this giving stuff like there was in the Old Testament, but let me just tell you how this goes easy. If you give when you receive, you give up front. I made a decision years ago to do payroll deduction. It never gets in my hot little hands, right? What I give to this church and have since its inception, it does not come to me. I automatically say, put it back in. I don't have any trouble spending that money because I get it out of my hands. If you live your life saying, okay, Lord, I want to give, and you give him the leftovers, there's never anything left over. Never anything left over. But I will tell you this from personal experience. You get it to him first, he will take care of you the rest of the way. 
I don't have a system to check all this, but I do watch people. And when people are in financial trouble, one of the first things I say, Lord, well, if, if something's not right here and they have not figured out sowing, reaping, giving, this is going to go poorly. It's, there's just something to it. Uh, and you better figure it out. Because if you don't learn to manage your money, uh, you've heard me say this repeatedly, if you can't give 10 on 100, you'll never give 100 on 1,000, you'll never get 1,000 on 10,000, you're not going to do it. Right? Because the numbers get big. A million bucks. The government takes their chunk and now you're down to nothing. Well, I'm not giving, I'm not giving this to the church. Well, there you are. We've already figured out who you are, where you are. You can't outgive God. Not going to happen. Just not going to happen. Proverbs 13, 4. The soul of a lazy man desires and has nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be made rich. Uh, I get people have issues. I'm just, I got to be careful because I don't, I don't have much patience for lazy. Right? If a man doesn't work, he shouldn't eat. Now, if you can say, well, I'm, I got dis disabled or, you know, I get all that. Okay, let's take care of those people, the poor. I get that. But if you're just lazy, you're just lazy. Oh, I, you know, I wish I had that. Well, get a job and go get it. Right? Well, that's not fair. He got that. I wonder how he got that. Maybe he gets up and goes to work. Now you say, well, I'm trying to find work. I'm not lazy. I get all that. But if you're just straight up lazy, you're lazy. Don't be lazy. I got more verses for lazy. Proverbs 16, 3. Commit your works to the Lord and your thoughts will be established. Commit your works to the Lord. Okay, you say, Lord, here's what I'm doing. Is this what you want me to be doing? Man, it just changes everything about your life, how you live your life, how you run your life. Business decisions, don't leave God out of your business. Because you're going to get to a situation where you don't know what to do, but he does know. And why wait till you're desperate to ask him? Ask him all along the way. He'll tell you all along the way. <sighs> Proverbs 20, verse 4. The lazy man will not plow because of winter. He will beg during harvest and have nothing. Oh, it's cold. I don't, oh, I can't plow in this. What are you talking about? Proverbs twenty two sixteen. He who oppresses the poor to increase his riches, and he who gives to the rich will surely come to poverty. You want a real life situation on this? Get get this day laborer thing. You got people who are here illegally behind a convenience store somewhere, and some Christian man rolls up in there, throws them in the back of his truck, takes them to a job site, makes them work, and then doesn't pay them. You know why he didn't pay them? Where are they going to go to the cops? And you think, ah, oh, you know, I, I got, I saved some money. I worked them and or they can't do anything. You better get you a brain somewhere. God's watching all this mess. You know, you hit that tether ball hard, it's going to come around and smack you in the back of the head. Um, there, there's consequence to this stuff. Um. And I, I'm, I've prayed about this, and I'm still praying about it, but here we go. There's a, there's a man who's no longer in this church from years ago where he was hiring people who were undocumented workers. And I challenged him on it. And he said, well, it's none you. See, when you, when you really start going down to the nitty-gritty and then and then here's what happens then i start hearing all these rational lies to rationalize the behavior oh but oh but oh but 
I've been using the old butts on the speed limit for, for a long time. The sign says 75. You know, I, I, this is how I think. I was driving down Highway 77, and in my demented minds, if I get pulled over, I say, well, officer, I must have confused the, the highway number with the speed limit. I thought it was 77, your honor, you know. We're all crazy people. Stop trying to cut corners. Just do the right thing for Christ's sake. Well, but I can make, just do the right thing. You're, you're destroying your testimony because people watch. You say, well, it's not fair. They seem like they're watching Christians harder. Of course they are. They're trying to find some hole in your, in your armor. Don't give, them, don't give them something to shoot at like that. Every businessman in this room or woman and beyond here has a reputation. Why don't you go ask around what your reputation is? Oh, he's a, he's, he's a cheat. I hear about, forget business, I hear about preachers who cheat playing golf. What in the world is that? And that's the reputation they have. Oh, yeah, he cheats. He, you know, he doesn't keep his score. Anyhow. Um, ver, uh, Proverbs 23, 4. Do not overwork to be rich. Because of your own understanding, cease. And then just on your, you know, Proverbs 31, talking about businesswoman. My goodness, I'm not going to take time to read this whole thing. I mean, I'm married to this woman, but if you're not married to this woman, go read about her in the Bible or say hi to my wife. Um, I mean, this woman, something else. She's bringing it up early, making stuff, selling stuff. She's, she's something. So there's not that this is not a thing. You just have to... You, there's no reason to lose your, your marriage, your family, your children for, for money. What are we doing? Proverbs 28, 6. Better is the poor who walks in his integrity than one perverse in his ways, though he be rich. Better to be poor and have some integrity than rich and be perverse. Luke 10. Now, I'm, I'm going to read you this story in a completely different light. This is the story about the Good Samaritan, okay? Luke 10, 25, Behold, a certain lawyer stood up, tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said, What is written in the law? What is your teaching of it? Your reading of it? So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You've, right, you've answered rightly. Do this and you will live. But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, Who is my neighbor? Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jer Jericho, fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, departed, leaving him half dead. Now by a chance, a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a, Le a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. Now who is, it's not just that he's a Samaritan. This guy is on a business trip. This is, his, this is his livelihood. He's going somewhere on a business trip, and he does not separate out his compassion from his business. Oh, I give to that shelter. They'll take care of this. No, I'm here on my way. This is my problem. As a, a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. When he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him, bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave it to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So on my way back through, I'll pay you back. 
So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, he who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. So this is what I keep telling you. Go and do likewise. Be a Christian every day. You're in ministry. You say, no, I'm not. I'm in business. What do you think you're there for? I texted a guy before I came out here. He's, set, he's, in, he's probably listening right now. He, I know he is. He's been in the hospital for, for three weeks, every weekend. And he says, I'm still trying to figure out why I'm here. And I'm going to call him later, but I'll tell him right now. All your complications, all this health stuff, is, is, I'm telling you, there's somebody in that hospital. Pay attention. So you say, well, but I'm, I'm sick. I'm, you know, I'm, 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 I'm having a problem. I got a flat tire. My engine blew. Whatever it is, stop. Get your brain off of your issue and start looking for the people. You're on your way. Be a neighbor. Go and do likewise. So your radar has to be scanning. And when your radar is scanning for the kingdom of God, the glory of God, to let him, to, where you're willing to say, you own me, not just my business. These are your hands. This is, these are your eyes, your mouth, your feet. I will go where you want me to go, do what you want me to do, say what you want me to say. Then if out of that relationship, you have a situation in your business because you're already in conversation about everything else. You say, Lord, what, are, what do you want me to do in this situation? And then you get really quiet and he says, do this. You say, how do you know that? Because you're listening. His sheep know his voice. So some big company calls up and says, hey, we want to order a million of your little trinkets or whatever it is. And the Holy Spirit says, don't sell them to them. What are you, crazy, God? Hey, is it my company or yours? I'm trying to protect us here. You might sell them. They're not going to pay for them. This customer will put you out of business. This, trust me. I know what you don't know. I see what you don't see. I am God. And I ain't your partner. I'm your owner. Do what I said. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. And then you don't sell your million trinkets and six months down the road you find out everybody that sold to them is out of business. And you would think after a while you'd go, oh, wow, that was close. I think I should listen to you more. And you say, well, but if I do it this, this way you're describing and live this way, what if God doesn't want me to be rich? What if he blesses me, but then he wants to give it all away? I don't want to be with, I don't want an owner like that. I want it for me. <laughs> what about my boat? What about? <laughs> <laughs> he's, 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 he's not going to let me do anything fun. He's going to ruin my life. No, you're already doing a great job of that. <laughs> you're smarter than God? <laughs> what if he says, give it all away? I did a little research. You go down the line. You go do a little, little reading up on Hobby Lobby. Go reading up on Kathy, Chick-fil-A. His quote's about People walk in a mall, people coming and going. There's one place shut down. They go, why is that place closed? Because it might be okay to rest one day. And so just closing one day a week made a statement to the world. Well, but I heard about, you know what? We heard a lot about you too, <laughs> right? So let's not be bringing up that no one's perfect. They're trying. Are you trying? Well, I'm just not doing this. God, it's none you. It's none of your business. It's none of your blank business, in fact. I wrote you a check. I gave you some money. I'll leave you alone. You leave me alone. Oh, now we're bribing God to leave us alone? <laughs> Acts 18. Um... 
th- this is, you know, I, some of this is like, oh, you think, well, is this something spiritual? It's all spiritual. It's in the scriptures. Acts 18.1, after these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born, to, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome. So how did God get him out of Rome? The, the ruler says, out of Rome. So they get out of Rome. And now they're where Paul is. And he came to them. So because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked. For by occupation, they were tent makers. They manufactured mobile homes. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath day and, per, and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. So Paul, who wrote half the New Testament, is now wasting his days making tents? Is that how you feel about your business? What if Paul has a reputation for not only making a great tent, but selling them at a fair price, and now when he goes into the synagogue to preach, he's not, his life is not a contradiction of his message? Your work is not a waste of time. Now, I will tell you straight up, the fact that I get to do what I do full time seems illegal to me. It's, and I come across pastors who are bivocational, and I'm, and I'm like, oh my gosh, Lord, this is, this is extraordinary. I don't take this for granted, right? And anyone who gets to, to do their work and their, their vocation and their, and their work all the same thing is, is mind-boggling. But, but there's nothing bad about any kind of work unless it's illegal, unethical, immoral, or unbiblical. But make sure you're doing it. Well, let's read the verses here. Um, 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Now, if you don't know what to do sometime, memorize this verse and just say, Lord, okay, this. Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. That's it. So if you work someplace and you're on a trip and some of the guys on the business trip say, hey, we're going over to, you know, we're in Vegas for a convention. We're going over to a strip club. You, uh, who's, who's going? You don't go, you're going to hell. You know, you don't have to get up and give a speech. Right? You just say, hey, guys, I'm out. I got, I got to go up to the room and call my wife and kids. Because I think they think that was a better idea. You say, but, uh, but if I don't go to the strip club with the guys, or women get caught in this too sometimes. Dude, I got, sorry, I got, I got stories about women taking guys to strip clubs to compromise them, and then they do business. You say, Lord, is doing this going to glorify you? And you listen, it won't take you long. He goes, nah, I'm out. You say, well, I might not get some business. Let God run his business and worry about getting you business. He can drop business out of the sky, right? Unless you don't trust him. Now, the lazy verse you can read later, 2 Thessalonians 3.10. won't read it. James 4. So this is some tremendous business advice, just life stuff. James 4, verse 13. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city. Spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit. Here's our plan. Now you say, well, what's wrong with it? There's nothing wrong with that. It seems like a logical thing. This is our plan. We're going to go to this new city, buy and sell stuff, and we're going to make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. So what is your primary concern? If this is what he wills to happen, this is what he wants, great. So you start the conversation with, Lord willing, today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit. If that's what he wants. 
Why go through all of this mess when if you just had a conversation? You just say, Lord, not my will, your will be done. I'm tired of doing what I want to do. Even if I think it succeeds, it's still a waste of time if it's not your will. You only got so many minutes, hours, days down here. Don't be blowing through them like there's no tomorrow. Stop. Think. Pray. Lord, is this your will? And if you're, again, if you're listening to him and he says, Richard, no, don't do that. And you go, okay. And then your friends say, hey, I thought the other day you said you were going to go to that, you were moving and going to buy and sell whatever it was and make some money. What happened to that? Ah, the owner shut that thing down. I met with the owner and he put the kibosh on that. What? I thought you owned your business. Yeah, I did. I signed it over. Now he owns it. And they say, what are you talking about? Okay, you asked. It's not my business. It's not my money. It's not my life. In fact, I didn't even wake me up this morning. So I can't take credit for any of it. Oh, dude, but you're smart. You're a brilliant business person. You're wise. You, you know the timing to buy and sell. Be careful when someone says that to you to go, well, you know what? You're right about that. <laughs> if you're really all that smart, you'd be following Jesus. If you're really all that wise, it would all belong to him. And then the only stories you got is, oh, yeah, I mean, I almost got myself in a big old mess. But he said no, and I trusted him and redirect. That was not his will. Verse 16, but now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. Now, the context of verse 17 is all that mess. So if if you know the right thing to do is not to go buy something, go do some business, whatever, whatever you're dreaming up, and the Holy Spirit has said to you, don't do that, and you do it anyway, anyway now it's, not, it's disobedience, but what is that? It's sin. The person who knows what is right to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. Now you're in big trouble. Now you're living a life of sin because you would not listen to God and you just barreled ahead and did what you wanted to do. And this is my favorite. When they come by the office, can I come by and see you? I say, oh, absolutely, come in, come in. Let's talk. What happened? Well, I, you know, I think something went wrong. Can't figure it out. I'm like, dude, I can help you. We can save a lot of time. You're an idiot. <laughs> Did you ask God before you made that decision? You can't imagine how many people have come through this church and they fall in love, sleeping with some woman, some man. They got it all figured out. And all we say is, hey, come by. Let's sit down and talk about it. Let's make sure this is all good. Oh, we're in love, dude. What could you pot? It's none ya. Okay. And then the phone starts ringing. Hey, can I, can I come by and see you? What happened? Well, it's not working out. It takes everything within me. I'm not going to say I told you so. But I'll take him in and start listening. Stop wasting God's time, your time, my time, everybody's time being such an idiot. Don't be a fool. Listen. Well, I'm lonely. I just can't wait anymore. I'm going to jump in this one. And then you want to come by and somebody try to fix it. I can fix it before you get in the mess. Everybody wants to talk to Jesus after they've made a mess. No one wants to talk to Jesus before they make the mess. Because the Holy Spirit starts saying, hey, what are we doing here? La, 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 You know, I can't hear you. I can't hear you. It's none of your business, God. And then every once in a while, someone gets a brain and says, okay, you know, this has never worked out good for me, business, anything else. Okay, Lord, what do you want to do? And then they start listening. What if you get three job offers? Which one do you take? What are you going to do? I'll tell you what you're going to do. You're going to listen and say, Lord, which one? Now, you'd think he'd say, oh, go with the one with more money. He may say, go with the one you hate. 
Lord, are you sure? Yeah, you know my voice. I said, take that one. That's, that doesn't sound very exciting. I'm not here for the excitement, big boy. I'm here to reach those people. And if you'll just get your backside over there and do what I told you to do, I'll get you out of there to something else you enjoy. I'm not worried about you enjoying it all the time. I'm trying to reach people. Grandma's been praying for them for 30 years. Take the job, go reach the people, and we'll go down the road. You know, well, that's what this is all about. It isn't about stockpiling a bunch of stuff you can't take with you anyway. Right? My favorite is, and we've talked about this a little bit, I look at somebody and I say, if you died today, where would you go? And every once in a while you get a, it's none of your business. It's none you. And I say, well, okay. But again, what I said earlier, do not die and stand before God and say nobody tried. I am trying to tell you that God loves you. Don't be a fool and end up hell because you end up in hell because you were stiff-necked, hard-hearted, and would not yield. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Say, God, is that you? This is gonna cost me my whole life and eternity. I'm listening. Father, thank you for your word. Uh, thank you for those in the room and beyond that are making the biggest decisions of their life, whether they're going to trust you with their eternity, with their sin even. And for whatever reason, today is their day. And they'd say, God, I know I'm a sinner. I screwed up. I need your forgiveness. I need your help. I cannot do this by myself. I don't want to do it by myself. I don't want to live alone. I don't want to die alone. And I understand now that Jesus died on a cross, shed his blood, was buried and raised from the dead to purchase eternal life for me, to offer me the forgiveness of my sins, and to give me a brand new life, new creation, old things gone, everything like being born again and starting over. I'm in, God. I accept this payment for my sins. I ask you to come live inside of my body in the person of the Holy Spirit and fill me and confirm to me that you have moved in. I yield my life to you, not just to save me from hell, but to be the boss, the Lord of my life, my business, my marriage, even my screw-ups. Give me wisdom to see how to proceed ahead, but to trust you, to hear your voice, to heed your voice, to see what the scriptures say, and to apply simple truths that change lives. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for loving me and for moving into my life. Father, for Christians, who have separated this thing out like people try to separate church and state now it's Christian and, and business uh, Father I pray that decisions will be made today to live lives that reflect your character and where people that know us know immediately even in our business transactions that we know you that we're not trying to cheat someone, not pay someone, not do our best. So uh, however, Holy Spirit, you've convicted people, each of us in this regard, then uh, I pray that we will follow through on that and make the changes that are necessary to live the life that you intended. We thank you, we love you, we trust you, we praise you, we worship you, and we pray that our lives would point only to you. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.